Okay, so welcome and good evening, everybody. Uh, because I'm the one that's beginning to, to, to speak this evening, I should introduce myself. I'm David Pike. I am one of several board members of the Family History Society of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, my role this evening is simply as moderator for the for the evening's lecture. So I'll basically be passing the microphone back and forth to a few people for the evening. Um, but I will point out that because of the pandemic, we clearly cannot meet in our usual venue of Hampton Hall up at the Marine Institute, which is why we've taken to having lectures online this season. This is brand new for us. We haven't done this before. So in some sense, it's an experiment. Uh, we are still learning as we go. So please bear with us if there's any technical glitches this evening. Hopefully there won't be, but uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, we do intend to have a question and answer period after the lecture is over. At that point in time, I will use my host privileges here to turn on the question or to turn on the raise hand feature, which is not currently active. Uh, but at that point in time, I'll mention this again, that that's when you can signal your intent to ask a question. And then I can actually turn on your microphone at an appropriate time to ask so that you can pose your question. Um, you probably cannot see a list of participants. I think that is the way WebEx is built by design for privacy purposes. Uh, don't worry, you're not alone. Currently, there are 77 people in addition to the three of us that you should be able to see video feeds for. Um, one other thing I need to point out is that uh, thank you to Memorial University for allowing us the use of WebEx as our online meeting venue. It's Memorial's license that we're piggybacking off of here this evening. Uh, presentation is being recorded. Our, it is our intent that this will be made available on our society's website at some point after the lecture is over, provided the quality of the recording is satisfactory. Um, and at that point, uh, I think I've said all I need to say for the introduction, so I will turn this over to Fred Smith, who's the president of the Family History Society, who can give some opening comments. So, Fred, you have the floor now. Fred, you can start talking anytime you want now. Okay. Sorry, okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the our Family History Society meeting for November. As David said, this is new for us. It's a new new endeavor, but it should be fun. And obviously we have a big turnout already, so that's fantastic. So um, my name is Fred Smith. I'm the president of the society. And uh, I'm not dealing with business tonight, but um, there's a couple of little things I should probably point out, let you know that um, our society is still doing well, even during the pandemic. Uh, we've managed to get three issues of Newfoundland Ancestor out. We have one more in the works. And um, our research team is doing a lot of research for people who write in. So if you have any research interest, just email or write, and we can try to help you out. Um, I can't resist saying that if you're staying at home because of the pandemic, it'd be a good time to write an article for a Newfoundland ancestor. I couldn't miss out on that. Anyhow, we're going to our speaker. And our speaker tonight is Dale Jarvis, who is an adjunct professor in the Department of Folklore of Memorial University and the Intangible Cultural Heritage Development Officer for Newfoundland and Labrador, helping communities to safeguard traditional culture. Dale has worked uh, for Heritage Newfoundland since 1966. 1996, sorry. He holds a BSc in Anthropology and Archaeology from Trent University and an MA in Folklore from Memorial University. In 2014, he served on the UNESCO Consultative Body to the Intergovernmental Committee for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, he regularly teaches workshops on oral history, cultural documentation, and public folklore. So please welcome Dan Jervis. Thanks, Fred. Sometimes it feels like I have been working for in heritage since 1966. I, <laughs> I, we, I have days like that. Uh, so we're gonna. I'm gonna share a screen here, and then we'll get under underway.
Donna. Let's start that. Let's start from the beginning. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, it's nice to, to know that there are people out there in the ether who are uh, joining us and, and listening and, and watching. I'll do, uh, I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit and, and talk a little bit about the work that I do with Heritage NL. So my name is Dale Jarvis and as Fred said, I'm a folklorist and I'm a public folklorist. And what that means is it's my job to help communities uh, safeguard those aspects of culture that they wish to, to save uh, and to uh, help make the information that we have around our local communities, uh, folklore and history accessible to the public. That is a big part of what I do. So um, today I'm going to be talking kind of informally uh, about the work that uh, we've been doing at Heritage NL and, and it's called Documenting the Dead and it's about the work that we've been doing for several years just to kind of increase the public knowledge around uh, cemeteries and burial uh, uh, sites in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and, you know, it, it's no surprise to anyone who's joining in tonight that we have a, a huge number of cemeteries in Newfoundland and Labrador, cemeteries and churchyards, lots and lots of burial sites all across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And they, and they range from uh, quite large cemeteries to individual uh, burial sites. And we have a lot of issues uh, with those. Uh, in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, abandoned cemeteries are considered to be archeological resources under the Historic Resources Act. So there is a certain level of protection uh, that is automatic with cemeteries uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. But like many other parts of the world, we, we have uh, issues with the uh, maintenance, ongoing maintenance of our historic cemeteries. Because we have so many, um, and in Newfoundland, we have so many that are in now resettled communities or communities where congregations have dwindled to the point where they're no longer able to uh, provide upkeep for cemeteries. Um, we, are, we are faced with some challenges in preserving our kind of historical fabric and the knowledge that comes along with it. And this is kind of a typical, uh, typical scene here, in many ways, a typical view of uh, something you might see in one of our many rural cemeteries. This is in New Chelsea, the old Methodist uh, graveyard or Methodist cemetery there in, in New Chelsea. And it is a, a headstone that we can see is precariously leaning. Uh, someone has attempted to do some bit of stabilization there at one point. This particular cemetery uh, exists in a community where the church is no longer active. There was a gentleman in the community who took it upon himself to regularly mow a path to the cemetery uh, and keep it somewhat open up. That man has since passed away. Uh, and that's kind of a, a familiar story that we hear quite often, that there will be some caretaker in the community who informally will look after cemeteries. And those, um, those people uh, don't always have the resources or the ability to, to really keep these older cemeteries up and running. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other problems, you know, that comes with cemeteries that are abandoned or perceived as being empty. We continue to have problems with vandalism uh, all across uh, North America with our historic cemeteries. It's not something that is unique to Newfoundland. It is something that happens all the time. Um, so certainly uh, neglect and vandalism is an issue, uh, but nature herself sometimes has, uh, has plans that uh, don't involve our plans. And I know that there are several uh, cemeteries in, in the province that are kind of at threat for uh, shoreline erosion. And this is probably something that we will see more and more often as storm surges uh, increase uh, with global warming. Um, and there's not a lot that we can do to prevent uh, some of this uh, erosion from happening. Often when our cemeteries are abandoned, they become overgrown and the, the markers that may or may not have been there are often lost uh, to sight. 
So we have all these pressures that are acting uh, against cemeteries in the province, but both man-made and, and natural. Uh, and so, you know, what, what can we do? Uh, what can we do to ensure that the information that resides in these uh, is, is maintained? Cemeteries really are, in my opinion, uh, kind of an open museum. They are museums and art galleries that exist out on the landscape. They hold uh, an incredible amount of information, both about individuals that is of use to people who are doing family history research, but also a lot of information about settlement patterns, um, how our communities have changed over time, the way we relate to one another, uh, and uh, the way that we interact with the dead in our community. Um, looking at cemeteries is a really interesting way at looking at how our society has changed over time. And um, because they are, uh, it, is a, it is a process of memorialization that uh, has been in place for as long as we have been burying people in this province. So what is the Heritage NL and what do we do and why do we care about cemeteries in our communities? Uh, Heritage NL, uh, which is the short form for the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador, has been around since 1984. And we were the organization that was established to largely deal with built heritage in the province. Uh, and in the early days of the Heritage Foundation, that was really interpreted to mean buildings specifically buildings and really not the lands around them. Um, that has expanded uh, over the, the, the last few decades with work that we have done. Um, but cemeteries have often been uh, part of the work that we have done when, when considered in relationship to uh, our many, many heritage church buildings in the province, many of which often have an attendant uh, churchyard or graveyard. Um, this example from Topsail here, St. John the Evangelist, here is one of our, our registered heritage structures. While the building is, is, uh, is a building that we are, um, have designated, the, the grounds around it are really important for understanding the context of that building. More recently, my work with intangible cultural heritage, uh, the, the non-physical aspects of our heritage, uh, also includes things like uh, burial customs and funeral rituals and how we how we think and process our thoughts around, around death and dying in our communities. So the Heritage Foundation is, uh, is a, established to help communities preserve those elements of their past and, and bring that past into the future to, to ensure that the past has a relevant life uh, as we move forward, that buildings have a, a purpose and a function in our communities, and that our spaces are well understood and used and respected to help us build healthy communities. So how do we do that with regards to cemeteries? A lot of the work that we do is around uh, education. And tonight specifically, we're going to be talking about documentation. So one of the, the big parts of the Heritage Foundation's work since the very beginning of the foundation was just to um, elevate the discussion around our historic resources in the province. Um, so that means telling the stories of historic places, which include, uh, which include cemeteries. Um, often cemeteries aren't necessarily well understood by communities. Uh, they may have a connection to an individual within the cemetery or the churchyard, but uh, they might not know uh, really all that much about what makes up a historic cemetery, about grave placement or the types of stone that you might use for headstones, the, the motifs that are inscribed uh, thereupon. Um, so a part of our work is, is helping communities better understand the fuller story of what cemeteries mean, that it's more than just a collection of birth and death dates. Um, and so documentation becomes a very, very important part of that. And uh, over the last several years, uh, we seem to be doing more and more. And, and a, a big part of my work is helping communities make sure that they have the tools to do things correctly so that they are documenting things in an appropriate way. This was some work we did back in 2016 in the General Protestant Cemetery uh, in St. John's, looking specifically at the Chinese uh, burials. We were fortunate 
enough to have um, Xing Pei Li working with us, who is a, a co-op student in the Department of Folklore, uh, and we got him uh, put to work at doing some translation and transcription for us. We had an opportunity with the student to uh, tell a fuller story of immigration and challenge uh, that existed in, in kind of early 20th century St. John's. So understanding those stories kind of helps us think about some of those things that are issues today, issues around immigration and otherness and fear of uh, foreigners. Um, we, we see those elements playing out daily in the media today, and they're the same things that our ancestors were dealing with, you know, 120 years ago in St. John's. So again, telling these stories is, uh, is an important part of what we do and making sure that we have the, all the documentation together. Those of you who are uh, not new to family history research in Newfoundland and Labrador know we have already a great deal of information that is out there uh, online and in various places. The Family History Society, formerly the Genealogical Society, has done a lot of work um, uh, documenting and transcribing headstone information. Uh, we are really dependent in the province on the work of volunteers uh, who do an amazing amount of work uh, documenting historical information and information in local cemeteries. And that's good and bad. It means that sometimes it's the only way we get that information made public, but it also means sometimes that it's inconsistent. People obviously do work on the family records that matter to them, the cemeteries that matter to them, and so sometimes there are gaps in some of these uh, in some of these documents. Many of you will know of the Stone Picks database, which was a private uh, enterprise to uh, record headstone information. Um, so some of this material does exist. Um, and, you know, for some communities, it's better than others. Some communities are very well documented and there are certainly gaps in, in other communities. So part of our role might be to help identify where those gaps are and work with communities to ensure that they have access to whatever information already exists so that people aren't out duplicating uh, their work. So this is us uh, back in 2016 doing some work there, a couple of our workers there. Uh, measuring out and mapping the, the Chinese section of the um, of the, the cemetery. Um, documentation needs to be done in an appropriate manner. And uh, one thing that we find is that sometimes uh, people have very well-meaning intentions uh, when they go into historic cemeteries and are dealing with historic materials. Um, but sometimes the things that people do uh, in order to better understand the information on a marker or headstone actually can cause damage to that headstone. So when we're talking about doing documentation, we talk about it doing it, we talk about doing it as um, as gently and non-invasively as possible. So this is one of my favorite stones in the general Protestant uh, cemetery. I think Suzanne Sexty is lurking somewhere there um, in the uh, in the the audience. You could probably tell you more about this particular stone than I could. Uh, this is for Richard Atwell or Atwill, who perished uh, during the construction of uh, George Street United Church. Um, uh, he was a Mason who had been brought over after the Great Fire uh, in 1846, 1847 and 48. He came um, and started doing uh, masonry work in St. John's. He fell from the building while it was under construction. And quite appropriately, his marker is a broken column indicating someone whose life is uh, cut tragically short. And you can see here that someone has gone to the work of scrubbing off a uh, part of the growth um, the discoloration that has formed over time on that stone to better reveal the text. That might make the text easier to read for now, uh, but it does lead to uh, kind of increased um, damage in the future. Every time we do something to a historic material, uh, we create sometimes more uh, harm than good. So I often, when I'm talking about uh, dealing with historic headstones in particular, my, my most often used phrase um, for Newfoundlanders is don't be at it. Uh, don't be at the surface of headstones. 
And we see all kinds of things that people do. They apply um, materials to headstones to make things more legible in the short term. That can cause uh, problems in the future. We see a lot of people painting headstones. There's a real tradition of that. And I fully understand why people do that. That in time will cause uh, conservation problems for the stone as well. Um, and you can see in this one, uh, I think actually someone made a mistake while they were painting the stone. You can see 18, uh, the, the, I, we're not even certain what the original date there, if it's 1899 or 1889 or 1809. Um, so uh, we need to be careful with the work that, that we do. Um, and uh, just as an aside, you can see that someone has also set this historic stone in concrete, which is not your friend. Don't, don't be at it. Um, people use all kinds of wonderful things to bring out tombstone inscriptions. Uh, you, you, when you go online and search how to, how to read cemetery tombstone inscriptions, you'll find all kinds of fabulous um, and not very good information, uh, much like most of the internet. Uh, so here we see biological growth that's been caused by shaving cream that someone has applied and then squeegeed off. Um, and, and while that may feel lovely on a gentleman's face, the, the oils that are left behind are, um, are conducive to this kind of biological growth. So again, we don't want to do anything to stones while we're doing documentation that will cause more and more damage. So one of the things that we've been doing with uh, Heritage NL is uh, going out with community groups and teaching workshops. This is in the very, very lovely uh, Presbyterian, small Presbyterian cemetery in Harbor Grace. It's a little gem of a cemetery. And if you're in Conception Bay and you haven't found it or, or explored it, it's worth, a, it's worth a look. It's one of my favorite little cemeteries in, in Conception Bay. Um, and we did a workshop there this summer with uh, some of the, the committee who are looking after the cemetery, but then also with the summer students who are working at the Conception Bay Museum and some summer students who are working with the, the Historical Society in Port of Grave, who are also doing a project, doing some documentation. So when we go in, we do a little bit of a talk about, about what the do's and don'ts are of cemetery conservation, and then we start to get people um, doing some recording. Uh, and there are multiple ways to record the information that is on headstones. Recently, we've been teaching people how to use a, a phone app called Billion Graves. Uh, Billion Graves is a phone app that allows you to use your cell phone to uh, take photographs of headstones. Um, so you're photographing the inscription, but you're also recording the GPS coordinates of every individual stone. It's a free service uh, and the app is free. You can download it onto whatever kind of smartphone you have um, and create an account on the billiongraves.com website uh, and it tracks, you know, how many things you've done. So here you can see that I, I've helped 538 people find records and I've uploaded 685 images and done however many uh, transcriptions and added supporting records. Um, so when you open your app on your phone, it kind of looks like this. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's meant to be as kind of idiot proof as possible, which is great for me. And when you are looking at a cemetery, this is one in Clark's Beach, the Salvation Army Cemetery. Um, you can see these little pins that get dropped into this map automatically. These uh, represent headstones. So uh, I think the, the green pins indicate uh, stones that haven't yet been transcribed. And then as you do more and more, the map kind of fills out. And this is kind of what it looks like when you're looking at uh, the record. You, you're given the, uh, the cemetery name there at the bottom. If the cemetery doesn't already exist, you can create one. Uh, and then you can photograph all this information. The information uh, is then when you have Wi-Fi back at your house or your office, you can upload all your photos to the website uh, and it creates a digital map with all this information. Um, so a couple of years ago, we did a workshop with the Logie Bay Middle Cove Outer Cove Museum on a cemetery transcription. We did a follow-up workshop with the, the Billion Graves app, and we uh, helped the community museum and the parish uh, do records for all the headstones in that particular uh, cemetery. 
And this is what it looks like uh, when you look at the site later. So here we have St. Francis of Assisi Cemetery in Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove. Um, and each one of those orange dots represents a headstone. You can see some of the ones that are green. Those means that they haven't been transcribed yet. This is a fabulous website. If you've used websites like um, uh, findagrave.com, it's very similar. This one is really nice in that it has that GPS locating uh, ability. And this is a global project. You can go anywhere in the world and contribute. Once you upload your records, um, each individual stone uh, gets a page on, on it, much like findagrave.com. Uh, um, and people can go in and volunteer to do transcriptions. So, for example, we did the 300 or whatever headstones that existed in St. Francis. We uploaded them. And when we came back a few days later, volunteers somewhere in the world had done most of the transcription work. Um, and there's the ability here to add other records, to add photographs or uh, life histories, memories of that person, um, and e each one creates um, a record online. When we were doing the work with the Logie Bay Middle Cove Outer Cove Museum, um, there had been some of these survey forms will look familiar to those of you who've been around with the Genealogical Society. Uh, so the, the Family History Society maintains um, an archive of these. You can, if you're a member, you can go online and see which cemeteries have been done. The museum had a number of these record forms already filled out, uh, but only up to a certain point. So there were gaps in their records. The parish office had some records of what existed, and then uh, there were new burials and new headstones that had never been recorded before. So using a combination of uh, these forms going out and doing new transcriptions, using the forms that already existed, and then using the data from the, the Billion Graves app, um, we're able to create really uh, complicated spreadsheets of, of information. And these uh, we have been doing on Google Docs. So they're available. You can work on them collaboratively with your group. Uh, uh, Katie Crane, who was the museum manager at that point, has set up um, kind of a template that you can download for free if you're starting uh, a cemetery work in your community. This uh, uh, takes all that information that's on those transcription forms and then makes it um, searchable and sortable. So if I want to do searches for uh, birth date or death date um, by marker type or by family name or first name, I can, I can rearrange all this information however I want it. And then each line on this database is then linked back to that billiongraves.com uh, website so that every single headstone um, has, a, uh, has a link. And this one in particular, uh, it, it's not even headstone, it's actually individuals. So th there are marker numbers, you'll see there marker five is listed there twice, there's two different people. And so that allows us to kind of pick out uh, individual data and do really interesting searches, really useful for people who are doing family history research, but also for people who are maybe interested in other aspects of Newfoundland history. One of the things that I'm really uh, fascinated by is our history of uh, uh, stone carving, uh, tombstone making, headstone making, monument making in the province. Um, we have some very old firms such as Muir's, which I think was founded in the 1840s, 1847 it says there, but I'm, I think that that date might be a little uh, off. Um, and so I'm interested just in seeing, uh, you know, who has carved what in the province. Um, and these kinds of spreadsheets allow us to track, you know, which stones were made by uh, Frederick Chislett, noted uh, tombstone carver and um, uh, long distance speed skater. Uh, he uh, was a really fascinating character, you know, but now we can start to actually uh, quantify some of that data that exists in our cemeteries. So for St. Francis of Assisi, I just did a quick graph showing from 1888 up to 1946, um, what percentage of marked 
headstones were made by which company. So these are the four companies that were working at that time, uh, Cook, Kenny, Skinner, and, and Muir's. And you can see how over time um, they kind of uh, shifted and changed. And, and so the Skinner's were kind of really active in, in the early to mid 20th century. Um, Muir's is consistent all the way through with other uh, kind of tombstone carvers rising and, and falling throughout the centuries. So this kind of data, this kind of extrapolation, uh, it, it lets us look at history in kind of a different way. But we need those good, we need those good databases and, and good uh, collection materials first. That allows us to do all kinds of things. Uh, this isn't new uh, by any stretch of the imagination. This is an example from the 1960s, Jimmy Dietz. Um, who wrote the book in Small Things Forgotten, um, kind of tracking how headstone iconography shifted from the 1720s uh, to the 1820s. So we could now do uh, graphs or charts like that with the data that we've collected from St. Francis of Assisi. And the more we have, the more cemeteries we have who do that, the more complex our understanding of, of the past can become. Um, and I love that transition of uh, iconography from past uh, to present. I've, I was saying uh, this morning, uh, I did an interview in, in CBC Cornerbrook, uh, and I said I, this summer I had never seen so many uh, bingo cards uh, etched into headstones as I had this, this past summer. All kinds of fabulous things showing up on headstones now. It's a whole other uh, talk for another time. But now we can actually, we have a way that we can kind of track how that stuff has changed. Um, we can also track, you know, what kinds of materials were being used when. This is a, a fairly early example of a slate marker from um, one of our former board members, Doug Wells, down in uh, Harbor Breton. Um, and it and allowed us to track kind of unusual things that we find in some of our cemeteries. Uh, there was an article that I wrote a few years ago for uh, Newfoundland Ancestor about white bronze monuments um, and a very, very specific type of material that is very rare in Newfoundland. I think there's only about five of these that I know of in St. John's. Um, and, and it allows us to kind of delve in a little bit deeper into the, the lives and histories of these people and why they were uh, choosing to have their cemetery markers uh, made of such an unusual material. You can go back in your back issues of the ancestor and uh, read that. So where do I start as an individual? What do I, what can I do? Uh, we've created a page uh, on, on Memorial's website. So if you go to mun.ca slash ICH resources, um, that will take you to a page that will then show you this cemetery conservation resources for Newfoundland and Labrador. And there's this scrolls on and on uh, with all kinds of links um, to how to document um, what to do with abandoned cemeteries, how municipalities can designate cemeteries, um, and that, that's where you can download those uh, blank cemetery database spreadsheets. Also some good information, maybe a little bit dated, about conservation and repair of grave markers. That's something that uh, we're, we're hoping to um, pressure uh, Robin Lacey, who's probably watching this presentation right now, into doing some more work for uh, us around. Um, so that's where you can get a copy of that form if you're doing research, um, and, and hopefully it will lead to things like this. So you can go online to that site and you can go and have a look at the St. Francis of Assisi. There's two cemeteries now that are up online, St. Francis of Assisi and I think um, the Anglican Cemetery in uh, Trinity um, are both uh, online in this format. So you can go on and uh, anyone can look at it. You, you can't access the editing function, but you can go in and you can uh, rearrange the orders of, of things and sort them however you want and do searches for potential family members. So we continue to do all kinds of uh, interesting research. Uh, I, I always think that our stories around burial and, and funeral customs are not really as well known as they as they could be. Um, I'm always finding the kind of obscure little things. Uh, like lich gates. Uh, this was a tradition here in the province. There are only two remaining, one in Bonavista and one in Cornerbrook. Um, 
very closely associated with the Anglican church. These were ceremonial gates that um, kind of marked the entrance to uh, churchyards and cemeteries. Uh, this is at the Mortuary Chapel, uh, Alexander uh, Chapel in, in Bonavista. And if anyone knows who this woman is, I would love, uh, I would love that information. Um, we also uh, do what we can to share our information uh, and, and interview other people. Whenever I can uh, add to the oral history record around people doing work in cemeteries, uh, the Heritage Foundation has a podcast called Living Heritage. If you Google Living Heritage podcast or look for it with your podcast app on your phone, um, you can uh, listen to the work that we're doing around all kinds of traditions in Newfoundland and Labrador. But I'm always up for a chat about what's happening with local cemeteries. So this was a conversation I had back in the pre-COVID world uh, with uh, my 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 partner in uh, in in love of the General Protestant Cemetery, uh, Suzanne Sexty, um, and there's other uh, podcasts that we've done there with other people who have been in, involved with cemetery work, both in in Newfoundland and away. Um, and so you can go and you can listen to those and and hopefully get some ideas and thoughts about uh, what you might be able to do in your own local cemetery. So uh, a lot of the work, as I said, of uh, doing cemetery documentation is done by volunteers, and that can be at the individual level. Um, but then if you have a group of people behind you, a town heritage group, a parish council, um, you, we can all do more work when we work uh, together. And there's lots of things that we can do as communities um, to do better documentation around our historic cemeteries. Um, one of the programs that we have at the Heritage Foundation is a designations program. Uh, Andrea O'Brien is our uh, municipality's outreach person. And right now, I think we have around 60 municipally designated uh, heritage cemeteries in the province. Um, and this is actually, if you are in an incorporated municipality, this is actually a fairly straightforward process. Uh, and it's a way of both kind of adding another layer of protection and uh, a little bit of promotion around the history of your town. So if you have any desire as a community member about how you might have your local uh, cemetery commemorated in this way, it doesn't come with any funding, uh, but it does give a little bit of promotion. And, and sometimes it allows you maybe to access some other funding from another agency somewhere down the, down the road. You can certainly call uh, myself or Andrea, send us an email about municipal designation, uh, dale at heritagenl.ca or andrea at heritagenl.ca. Um, we're both really interested in getting more and more communities uh, involved in this uh, kind of proactively designating um, cemeteries in the province. Um, Andre O'Brien uh, kind of wears uh, two hats, uh, like many of us. She, she works for Heritage NL. She's also on the town council in Cape Royal. And this year, Cape Royal had a Conservation Corps green team. So this was a, a project where they were able to hire four local students to do some cleanup work in the cemetery. Um, really interesting municipally designated cemetery there in Cape Royal that has managed to maintain many of its uh, grave enclosures, all this cemetery fencing. Um, and I think sometimes there's kind of a, um, uh, not a lot of appreciation, not a lot of love for the cemetery fencing. I know a lot of, uh, active cemeteries actively encourage the dismantling because it's easier to mow, um, but it just does change the story of your cemetery. They are a historic resource, and if we can kind of educate people around uh, what they mean and how they are an important part of uh, family history, we would love to see more of those preserved uh, across the province. Here's another example of those lovely, uh, very varied uh, cemetery fences, uh, some amazing creativity. Uh, and these are both historic uh, right up into, into contemporary period as well. Um, something you don't see in, in modern active cemeteries, but were, which were a really important part of historic uh, burial places in Newfoundland. Um, 
where we can, we help uh, communities organize cleanup projects. We always want to do this somewhat carefully. People want to jump right into the work of, you know, cleaning up cemeteries. And again, before you start, uh, get some advice and make sure that we're doing things sensibly. We were in a cemetery this summer where uh, they had done a major cleanup uh, project. I'll put air quotes around cleanup um, and had kind of hydro seeded the, the cemetery to get a, a nice grass cover and they had pulled out all the um, wooden and metal crosses that marked graves. Uh, so it's going to look lovely, but they're not going to have any idea who's buried where, which is uh, a little unfortunate. And there were probably opportunities there to do some mapping and some recording, some better documentation before they started to do uh, the work of um, cleaning up. Don't clean up too much. Don't be at it, as I said. Um, even in uh, active cemeteries, you know, I, there are some lovely, well-maintained, uh, manicured uh, uh, churchyards and cemeteries in the province. Uh, even that kind of work can cause damage to historical material. So, um, if you are even just using a mower in a in a cemetery. Um, or using um, kind of a gas powered rotary cutters, whipper snippers, uh, they can cause a lot of damage. Um, and we often think of stone as being a permanent type of marker, but stone has a life cycle and is fragile in its own way. So even you know, your regular maintenance can cause damage in historic cemeteries, and there are strategies around um uh how to cope with that and and if you ever want to have that kind of conversation you can give us a call uh, as well so that's it um you can give me a shout uh if you have any questions about how to start community documentation projects uh give me a shout give uh andrea a shout um, and then the last kind of word i want to share is about how important it is to share the work that you do um, and again, this is either as an individual or as a, a community. If you are doing documentation work, if you're researching your family history, please find a way to make that uh, material accessible and available over the long term. Um, I hear stories about, you know, family genealogists, you know, oh, uncle so-and-so uh, researched that entire family history and then he died and all that information was lost. So if this is your life's work, um, a, certainly you can have a chat with us about ways to make that accessible. And I'm sure that the Family History Society would be interested in helping out with that as well. As Fred said, write it in an article and submit it to the uh, the ancestor. I know they're always looking for more uh, more articles, and it's you don't have to be a professional genealogist or a professional historian um, if you're doing research and tracking all that information. Again, do what you can to make it accessible for the next generation of researchers. Um, there is a Facebook group for Cemeteries NL. You can go there and uh, join and share your photos and ask questions. We, we watch that. You can follow me on social media at Dale Jarvis on Twitter. Uh, give me an email um, and I work cheap. I, I always tell communities, you know, you feed me lunch. I'll come out and uh, and do some work in your community. Uh, I am the provincial folklorist, so I work for you if you are living here in Newfoundland and Labrador. If you have any questions about historic cemeteries uh, and what to do or what not to do, certainly give me uh, give me a ring. Um, I've been talking here specifically about um, uh, documentation because I think that that is probably the most useful thing that communities can start to do. I think communities often want to jump right into the work of cleaning up a cemetery or or uh, potentially worse, uh, doing um, conservation or restoration work on historic stones. Uh, and my, I guess my final word is just don't be at it again. Um, if you have any questions about what to do, that's a whole other conversation that we can have and we can put you in touch with some people who know uh, a bit about uh, historic conservation. 
Again, there's lots of bad information on the internet and everyone has a buddy who thinks he knows the right way to do it. Uh, and chances are he doesn't really have a very good understanding of historic materials and how those age over time. Um, so reach out. We work for you at Heritage NL and uh, whatever we can do to help you share the stories of your historic cemeteries, we would love to continue the conversation. So with that, I'll turn things uh, back over. Uh, thanks again to the Family History Society for all the work that they've been doing for, uh, for decades on, on uh, conserving the information that comes from our historic headstones. Um, and I think we're gonna, I'll turn it back to Fred or David and we'll maybe open it up for some questions. Okay, so uh, Dale, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, we had over 100 people tuned in at one point, actually 103, I think was the peak. Pretend they're all clapping and that you can hear them. Um, <laughs> kind of hard to do in a video call. Uh, I'm going to now enable the raise hand feature. So anybody who wishes to ask a question, you'll have to hunt for it because I actually can't see it in my screen where it is. But somewhere in the participant window, there should be something you can click on to raise your hand. On my on my window, it's right down in the bottom right hand corner. There's a little hand symbol. Okay, so anybody who wishes to pose a question to our speaker, to Dale, uh, click on that, and then I will be able to unmute the microphone and you'll be able to ask your question and, and so on that way. Um, quick reminder: this session is being recorded, including the Q and A session. At least that's the intent. Uh, and. We still have 93 people tuned in, but as yet, nobody's raised their hand. Oh, here's one. Okay, so I'm going to click on the microphone for Dan Dauber or Dober. So, Dan, you should be able to, you should be able to speak now. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is Dober. Thank you. Yeah, uh, okay. Quick question. We have been living in a small community, uh, old graveyard. Uh, really grown in. There's been several projects, I guess, over the years, uh, cut out some trees and, you know, then smaller stuff grow up. Uh, need, really need to do some work over the next few years for sure. Well, is there any sort of protocol for cutting out large trees, you know, overgrown trees? Any suggestions there? Yeah, sure. So thanks. Yeah. So this is a this is a, a situation that a lot of communities find themselves in. You know, they they do a bit of work and then things grow back. That's what <laughs> that's what happens. And it's it is kind of a, an endless uh, process. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we say make sure you get all the documentation you can done first. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you are interested in doing some cleanup, generally, uh, what we recommend is uh, kind of think about the entire site before you really start to do anything. W when there are uh, trees, for example, or, or other kinds of vegetation that are growing in historic cemeteries, some things were put there on purpose and some things are invasive. So if it's all you know, dogberry trees, chances are they were never planted there, but you might have certain things like uh, willows. There's the very historic Willow Tree Cemetery in Hans Harbor where the willow was deliberately planted there in the cemetery. Um, often uh, one thing that was deliberately planted in cemeteries were rose bushes, uh, which mm -hmm. have an, a, an unbelievable tendency to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so uh, make a plan, I think is probably the first step. We, uh, if you are, uh, there's nothing wrong with leaving some mature trees in a, in a cemetery. Uh, I think sometimes people start to get, um, sometimes can get overzealous when it comes to removing trees and start, uh, exactly. when they start pulling up roots, then you can really start doing some damage to graves um, and you don't want to do that. So whatever you can do that is uh, kind of the less invasive, that's that's probably the good place to start. Um, but be prepared to that it's going to grow back. Um, yeah. That is that is kind of the unfortunate thing with our historic cemeteries. Um, that uh, ultimately we, uh, you know, cemeteries kind of have a life cycle of their own in a way. And um, we need to ensure that we preserve the information and, and note 
where the burials are. Um, if it is a historic cemetery, an abandoned cemetery, it's always a really good idea before you do any work to talk to the provincial archaeology office and make sure that they have it recorded as a site in their database. Um, you can't dig up anything in a historic cemetery. Uh, so uh, again, that's where you need to be careful around pulling up tree roots and things like that. Um, but yeah, make a plan, talk to the provincial archaeology office, start with the things that you know aren't of historical importance, like the dog berries and the maple trees that have that have grown up. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so Dan, can you lower your hand, assuming you have no follow up question? Yep. And put your uh, microphone back on mute too, please. Okay, so our next uh, question is going to be from Catherine Ryan. I just unmuted you. You can ask your question. Okay, hello. Um, really interesting evening. Uh, found it really, really interesting, I must say. Uh, Thank you. Mine is not really a question, but more just a, a little bit of a comment. I've done uh, a lot of, I guess, family. Um, delving into our family tree. Uh, my mother's family came from a, uh, a Syria. She's mm -hmm. a Lebanese community back in the 1800s. Gazine is the last name. Okay, a Bell Island Gazine? Well, uh, well she, she, she always says she's from the Cove, Portugal <laughs> Cove, but yeah. uh, she did live on Bell Island for maybe two or three years. Her grandfather and great-grandfather lived on the island. But as I guess a very young person at the time, around 15 or 14, I started to, I guess, get a bit of an interest in my family tree, I guess, with the different names and foods. And uh, so off I took. Anyway, researching the grave, the grave on Bell Island, the Gazine headstones are chiseled in Arabic mm -hmm. as well as English. Yep. And uh, I had a professor who was giving us some uh, Arabic uh, lessons I brought in a picture of of it to him and he said it's an actual poem that was chiseled on the side and he said it's quite it was back in 1939 I think it was made and he's he was amazed at uh, how intricate it was done yeah yeah it's really uh, yeah the Thank you, Kevin. The, the Lebanese story here is uh, is amazing. Uh, one of the programs that we have at Heritage NL is um, this is wow. This is very timely because we have a historic <laughs> commemorations program where community members can nominate things of, of provincial historic interest. And uh, today, actually today, Lorraine Michael nominated the the history of the Lebanese community. So oh, we're going to okay. be doing a bunch of research on that okay. um, and yeah and if you go I'm on Fleming Street in St. John's and if you go up to Belvedere Cemetery yeah. I know the the headstone is there for Kalim Noah yes. uh, the Noah building is downtown and his headstone is in uh, Arabic as well in the yes. in the Catholic cemetery they were the, a lot of those early uh, Lebanese settlers were uh, Maronite Christian they and then when they Yep. When they came here, they they there wasn't a Maronite church, so they converted to Catholicism. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a priest who used to uh, a Maronite priest used to come up, and then I guess the the war broke out, and so they had to then kind of uh, integrate within the Newfoundland. Uh, and they all married they all yeah. married good Catholic girls, and then they, they just did. had to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know Lorraine very well, and she's very passionate about her her heritage as well as I am. So, but so do stay in touch because yeah, I'd love to have a future conversation with you about your Lebanese family history. All right. Well, I was if I couldn't get on here tonight, I was going to email you about that. So perfect. I, I will email anyway. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I've muted Catherine. Catherine, can you uh, lower your hand? Uh, just to make you disappear from my list here. There are three other people who raised hands at the moment. Uh, Andrew Walsh, I just unmuted your mic. You can ask your question. Wonderful. Uh, thanks. So my question was about the, uh, the Billion Graves app. Uh, I was looking for something to record GPS coordinates of a cemetery that I'm working on cleaning out um, with the coordination of the parish there. And uh, I'm just wondering if with the app you can um, independently how do I say this? You can independently see the GPS coordinates written out so you could record them separately. Because I'm always concerned with these sort of apps that they're not going to be supported in two or three or 15 years. So yes. I wanted to have everything recorded myself to leave with the parish so that way they have the information. That is an excellent question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> okay. Um, I know you can, uh, you can, I think, add a record through the web 
based version of it using GPS coordinates. So if you were just if you were just recording individual GPS coordinates and then had them in a in a spreadsheet or something, I think there is a way to import them into Billion Graves. Um, that's I don't know. Send me an email and we'll figure it out because that's an important yeah, yeah. that's an important question. Um, the one thing that I do like about the 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 Billion Graves uh, website is that it, it's a not for profit organization that is. Um, I don't know if it's run by, but it's associated with uh, the Mormon Church, and so it's kind of integrated with FamilySearch.org, which is the Mormon version of uh, kind of ancestry. Um, and anyone who has ever done family history research knows how incredible the records are that the uh, the Latter Day Saints have. So that actually gives me more confidence in in the in that particular app than in things say like find a grave which i think is a is a fully owned um website that's owned by ancestry.com which is a for-profit organization so i i i'm not a, a member of the the church of latter-day saints but boy do i use their stuff all the time because they they have a really great um uh, archive. So I suspect they probably have a plan uh, for ongoing um, archiving of that of that information in some way. If I'd like to ask another question, should I requeue or should just I go ahead? OK, cool. The other question I had was it was kind of about um, graveyard management as well. Um, the graveyard that I'm specifically interested in and you might be interested in, Dave, because uh, or Dale rather, sorry, because I know you're pretty close, is the um, All Saints Cemetery in Samico in South River. Mm -hmm. Um, so the old one, I've been working with uh, the parish uh, priest there to get that cleaned up a bit over the last two years. And the approach we've taken is um, instead of taking out big trees, because my grandfather and his brother did that in like the 90s, they basically cut everything flat. It was down to a grassy field and then everything grew up again to the point where it is now, where it's basically forest. You wouldn't know it was there if not for the fence. Yeah. So um, what we've done is we've limbed all the trees in the lower like six feet uh, yeah. or like big spruce trees largely. And now in the last two years, nothing's grown underneath. They stay lower than if it would be mowed because there's just no light for the grass to grow. Yeah. So I think that that's the approach we're taking. Um, I don't know, and we're just dragging the branches out. I don't know if that's something usually suggested or because my thought is like rather than have to, the church doesn't have the money for constant upkeep. So yeah. our thought is if we if we limb the trees, they can grow 80 feet high and it doesn't hurt the, the stones, right? So yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I, eventually there will probably be some damage caused by tree roots, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, a trunk will grow too close to a stone. That's going to happen, um, and it's probably again. That's why you do the documentation so that you have the good records before all of that happens. Um, but yeah, anything like as I said, the 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 less invasive, the better. So um, yeah, I I I don't I'm not an expert in cemetery uh, conservation, but yeah, it's probably better than having to go in every year and cut everything down. Thanks. Okay, so the next uh, person with a question here is Catherine Peterson. Uh, you should be able to speak your question now. Hey, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for a really, really interesting talk. I really, really enjoyed and uh, and learned a lot. And I was curious, Dale, about um, as you know, communities are sort of working on the doc documenting um, of their local cemeteries. I was just curious if you're starting to see. Um, you know, communities using either abandoned or even historical cemeteries. Sort of as like social spaces, because um, like I, I'm uh, listening in um, from Ontario, and here I know it's 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 more getting more common for you know there to be cemetery tours or things like that to kind of draw people in and share some of that history. So I was just curious if you're starting to see, or if that's maybe long standing out your way. But thank you. That's great. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, the quick answer is not really. <laughs> I mean, I think there's an amazing potential for that. Uh, I started a as just as a private tour guide. I started a, a, a tour a couple of years ago in the General Protestant Cemetery here in St. John's. Um, there have been a couple of things. I know in Trinity, there's a ghost tour in Trinity that I think visits the cemetery. Um, but yeah, I think there's a real potential there. And I, and I think especially once if when tourism kind of returns to normal, uh, we, we really do see in Newfoundland um, kind of a growing genealogical tourism market, really, like a lot of people are coming here specifically because they have a family connection here. 
Um, I was out in, in, in Port of Grave this summer with a project that they have. They have Port of Grave is a, is a community that has kind of grown and incorporated other smaller communities, uh, Bear Need, Hibs Hole. Um, they have 40 burial sites, 40 known burial sites in that one community. <laughs> Um, and so they need to do some really good documentation around that. But I think there's the potential there. You know, if you have, uh, you know, a tourist who's coming from Port of Grave and say, well, my grandfather was so and so, where is he? There's an opportunity there for the local um, uh, heritage committee or whatever to be able to provide some of that as a service. Um, we're doing some work in Salvage right now uh, with their with the Fisherman's Museum in Salvage, which is very close to uh, a couple of historic cemeteries. And I know that like many community museums, they have copies of the parish records and some of the burial records in the museum. And again, I think there's an opportunity for community museums uh, to be uh, kind of a hub for exploring, you know, historic resources in the wider community. So I could see in that particular community, you know, having the museum be the center where you would go, you'd get your maps of the community and the trails to the cemeteries, and then from there go out and explore those spaces. Um, I think it's something that will happen here, um, and there's there's definitely an interested market for anyone who wants to start uh, cemetery tours. Good to know. Well, I will be joining in on them the next time. Hopefully I'm out your way. So that's great. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, so next up, uh, the name is truncated on my list here. So it's Dale Russell Fitz P. It might be Fitzpatrick, but I can't tell. It's Dale number two. Hello, Dale. Yeah. Hi, Dale. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, couple of, I, I'm sorry, I'm actually calling you in tonight or just dropping in from Ontario. And uh, I pulled up a little bit on the uh, time zones uh, calculation. So I'm not sure if you touched on this already, Dale. Do you have um, a preference or pros and cons of volunteers uploading to Billion Graves and or family uh, find a grave? I know you just mentioned about five yeah. minutes ago that one was like the Mormon. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you in know, the meantime, Find a grave zone by the Mormons as well. Oh, is it okay? Well, then there you go. Yeah. <laughs> everything, as long as everything's owned by the Mormons, we'll be fine. Uh, and, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't know if it ultimately really matters one versus the other. We've been using the Billion Graves app simply because it has that GPS function. Yeah. Right. Um, and if Find a Grave had that, then I would. I, I think more people are familiar with findagrave.com. Um, the, the databases that we've been developing, like we developed a, a database for Logie Bay Middle Cove, Letter Cove. Um, it, we have a, a column there for, for Billion Graves. We can easily add a column for, for Find a Grave as well. Um, and I think as long as the information, whatever platform you're comfortable with, get the information up there, um, maybe make a, a, a you know, a, a print copy and give it to your local historical society, your local library, um, right. just so that there is a, a backup of that information. So um, we're, we're I don't think it's a competition. More... Yeah, no, exactly. And the thing is, is that, yes, you're quite right. Like, Billion Grays makes it easy. Like, I did a section of the Briggs Anglican this summer in less than two hours. And, yeah. you know, I forget it was like 300 and some odd headstones. However, uh, the Find a Grave people, who are indeed the same people. <laughs> um, they now, if you go into any headstone and if you put in suggest edit, you won't see it if you're just searching, but if you go in for suggest edit, there's a place now where you can add the GPS coordinates. If you, are, if you are not the original poster of that. Yeah, so, the technology is just getting better and better all the time and- Totally. Next and, year, there'll be something else that's even better than those two, and we'll be back talking about it again. Yeah. But one of your uh, other persons who put up their hand and called in was uh, asked about, you know, what platforms. And I use a smartphone, and I can, if, you know, you can actually tag where you are. It's, you know, it's just you, you, you do the spot on the map. And if you had, for example, and I guess here's my thing is, if the Newfoundland Labrador Genealogy Society on that head marker form put in or people could, 
obviously themselves write in this is we're going to put in the coordinates now when we do this particular graveyard but that's something that most all of us have on yeah. our forms these days so we could be writing it right in those forms and there's a there's a suggestion for the board members of the, exactly. of the history society so, you I mean, can update like, your old forms just to update that <laughs> in that regard yeah yeah um, absolutely well, I know because I've I've been you know I've documented a a, a, a complete headstone and do, a database for our local Roaches Line Cemetery uh, that's non denom it is actually operated through the United Church. However, it's been it's a non denominational. Anybody can be buried there, and everybody has been over the years. And I've just done that this summer, and it's thinking like, who else can I give it to besides the Brigus and the and the Cupid's Historical Societies and things like that? Well, I would certainly say give give a copy to the Family History Society for their for their records. Um, and well, you can always you can always talk to me, and we can maybe there's a, a way to put some of that on the Memorials Digital Archive uh, as sure. well. Uh, the other thing that the, that you raise is that there. Uh, you know, we are in a kind of a situation now in Newfoundland and Labrador where a lot of uh, churches are talking about closing. And yes. I think there's a real concern about what's going to happen to a lot of church records. Um, so if, if anyone out there is listening and is involved with those conversations with your local congregation, um, make sure that you know, those records go somewhere, like either to the the diocese archives or to the rooms or Family History Society, make sure make sure that there's a plan for those records but as as part of, you know, kind of the uh, the deconsecration of local churches. I think that's really, really important. Yeah, I actually I think that trickles down from the top. I think most of the diocese say that they have to Dale, I will we'll, again going back to the GPS thing. And, I, and I'm sorry that I I don't have this at the top of my head, but um, there are freebie software, uh, mostly used in England, where you can, uh, through a Google Maps, you can actually put in the GPS coordinates and it will actually populate your particular cemetery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at doing that uh, for through the Cupid's Historical Society. So I had done some research Mind you, that was four or five years ago, and the actual software and the programming has, has gone out of my mind. But if anyone would um, like it, I can certainly uh, dig it out again. And uh, you just basically need somebody who's savvy with uh, using a computer and GPS and a database. And um, the graveyards that I looked at in Britain were quite interesting and in that you just I, I didn't know any of the people that were buried there and you just sort of did a little click and it would pop up, and, you know, Joe Blow died this, this sort of thing. So it's interesting because genealogy is so much now of a tourism attraction uh, that people, if we can't travel, that's a nice way to do it for those who are many miles away. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining in from Ontario. And when you're back on Roach's line, we'll have to have a chat. Indeed. All right. Take care. Thank y'all. you. Okay. So we've got three other people who have been patiently waiting. Uh, so up next is Sarah Jane. You can now speak your question. Okay. Hi, everybody. If you can hear me. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the lecture. I learned so much that I did not know before. I did not even know that this kind of documentation existed. So that was. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Very nice to find out. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> um. So one of my questions is: I'm originally from like a very small area in Newfoundland on the east coast, like around Trinity Bay, actually. And a lot of my family, like history past, came from resettled communities like British Harbor and Spaniards Cove where the cemeteries are like basically non-existent anymore. And there's some headstones out there that are like falling over and you can barely read them. So I saw one in your presentation that you said people put shaving cream on it to try to read it better. And like, I've also seen online people like put paper over it and try to do like scratchings to read it better. But how do you suggest to get the information off a headstone if you can't see it clearly? Yeah. 
Wow, that's we could do a whole night just <laughs> just on that. Um, so yeah, I guess the thing to remember is you know any don't add anything to a historic stone. Even even I think now like years ago at the Heritage Foundation we did workshops on doing tombstone rubbings, and and I think the general consensus among archaeology people and conservators is uh, anything that puts pressure on that stone, especially if it's those old marble headstones, um, marble goes through a process called sugaring. So if you touch an old marble headstone, it feels like a sugar cube. And that's actually the surface of the, the, the stone kind of disintegrating. So any rubbing on that is just going to accelerate that process. Um, your best uh, thing to try is, um, is, is using light. Um, so using a, either using a mirror uh, for for reflecting sunlight at an angle, um, or uh, these days it's really easy to get a high powered um, LED flashlight um, and kind of sh not shining it directly on the stone, but shining it across the stone so that um, you pick up the the shadows of the inscriptions. Um, that's probably the least invasive and safest way to do it. Uh, and I think um, the other thing that is just is just kind of common sense, really, is that you, you kind of need to go slow, like have a have your notebook. And sometimes it's just like a word uh, or a letter at a time. And, and you kind of figure out how many spaces there are. Like it, it can be very painstaking to try and figure out some of those old uh, inscriptions. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I always say to people to, and, and again, I, I keep going back to this idea of documentation, um, it might already be done. Uh, someone may have already done that research. So uh, talk like if you are, are going to that, that site, look online and see if someone's already done transcriptions for that cemetery, then you can print them out uh, and take them with you when you go. Um, yeah. You know, we we see even I I know even some of the records that the the Family History Society done had done in the you know the early nineties. Um, I we were working with a church in in Carbonier where they had done where the Family History Society volunteers had done that work in the early nineties, and even now, you know, thirty years later, some of those inscriptions are barely legible. Um, uh, but having those documents is really, really important because the work's already already been done. So, um, so yeah, those are the two things. Uh, do your homework before you go and take a really good flashlight. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our next uh, person with a question is Cindy Salvato. You can now speak. Um, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, first, hi, thank Cindy. you. This is a fabulous lecture. I'm, I'm loving it. Um, my family and I um, uncovered a small cemetery called Gusset's Cove um, in uh, Broad, Broad Cove, uh, Blackhead area. Okay. Adams yeah. Cove. Yeah. And uh, it was like buried under um, mountains of blueberry bushes. <laughs> yes. And um, our biggest, the biggest question we have, because we're trying to, we tried, we're trying to document everybody who's in there. We think we got everybody. But where are all the church records? <laughs> They're that's not the, in the <laughs> <laughs> My God, that's like what every every family history person wants to know. <laughs> where yeah. are they? We looked we looked on um uh uh family history site and that that was good. F S um F H S N L and we found a, a small list of Gusset's Cove people there. We went on uh, um, family family search, found some other Newfoundland records there, and found more people there that look like you know the microfiche of the originals. The archdiocese does not have any of the records. The church doesn't have any of the records. So I just thought maybe you guys might know. <laughs> Welcome to the world of doing your own family tree. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's that's the the situation. And sometimes in Newfoundland, our, our records are just not very good. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the reality. You know, it and it is getting. Um, not that the records are getting better, but access to the records is getting better. Like there's more and more stuff getting digitized and put online and right. and. Uh, 
so I find even, you know, going back after a couple of years of looking at one particular thing, there's new records online now that I didn't know of before. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but a lot of those like little parish churches, uh, you know, the records are just, they're gone. They're just, they just don't exist. We had a lot of church fires, uh, like I've heard so many times about records okay. being destroyed in fires. Um, it is a it is a challenge and um, you might work for years and not find anything. Um, but don't be discouraged because you are just as likely to kind of luck into something at some point. Okay. Um, and the other great thing about all the online stuff now is that you're not alone and everyone's family trees all kind of meet up at some point. So people are all looking for that same information. So the more sharing we can do, the, the better. OK, there's no easy solution, but just no. uh, keep at it. <laughs> Great class, great lecture. I'm Thanks. in Rhode Island. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Thank okay, you very so much. I'm going to mute Cindy. We now have a list of four people. Uh, given the time for the yeah. meeting, we might stop it after those four. Okay, so Pat Angel will be our last, uh, yeah, our last question. question. Okay, so uh, uh, Carrie Moores, I think, is yeah, up next. Carrie Moores can now speak your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, I have a couple questions. The first one is when I went up three years ago to visit um, family and see my dead relatives, um, I noticed that my great grandparents' headstone, the piece that's right on the ground, was crumbling. Mm -hmm. is, is there a way to get that fixed? I'm in Boston, so I <laughs> can't leave Massachusetts right now <laughs> to go up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, is my tentative answer. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's really finding the right people who know what they're doing. Uh, and there's any number of people who will gladly take your money and not know what they're doing and, and do it as well. Um, uh, Maybe uh, can just send me these things for me to send me an email and and uh, and I we can have a we can have that conversation and I can help you try and figure that out. Okay, because just, I would love to go up there next summer, but as of right now, I have no idea if yeah. I can or not. And my other question is, is that when I was up there in 2017, I took pictures of a lot of the headstones that are in the Blackhead um, New United Church Cemetery in mm -hmm. the and Brad Cove up in Conception Bay. I would love to share them. I don't know how to and and okay. who to share. It's the new, <laughs> okay. and I know that cemetery, I don't think has been transcribed yet. It's the relative. Right new one okay um that is uh put that in the same email <laughs> i right. think and we'll and we'll figure it out i mean we'll figure out the best home for those photos and and figure out what your options are for for sharing them okay um thank you very much you're very welcome so yeah it's just dale at heritage nl.ca okay, so thanks Okay, so next up is H. Burry. You can now speak. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Great. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. I'm a bit of a, well, I would say I'm calling from Ontario, and I'm a bit of an old hat at this in that I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, I've been, I guess I have two full questions. One is um, kind of relates to what people were asking before. Um, I started adding or contributing photos to cemeteries with the Newfoundland Grand Banks mm -hmm. with, with Don Tate, and I got about maybe 60 to 80 percent complete. Then I try to kind of change gears and move to find a grave. And that's where I am right now. And now I'm hearing all the wonderful things about billion graves. So I kind of related to a question that was asked earlier. Yeah, where do you? Do you stop one and move to the other, like <laughs> duplication of effort here? Like what? I would say if you are familiar with one platform and have been adding stuff to that platform, just keep doing it. Just be consistent in the work that you do and just put it all in one place. Okay. And the other question is, 
Uh, I've been uh, an advocate for a cemetery in the Glovertown area near Salvage. I think you mentioned Salvage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worked with a uh, worked with an archaeologist, Lori McLean. McLean, yes. Yeah. And uh, he's helped us. And uh, this particular cemetery, like, goes back to the early 1800s, and I, and it's been registered with the PAO office with a board number since uh, back in the 1990s, I think. Great. My my question is, we have run into in the recent years, we've run into issues with, um, I guess you would call it encroachment on the cemetery. And we've looked to the PAO to give us some help, some guidance, some. And uh, do you know anything about or can you speak to what sort of protection the PAO actually provides? <laughs> Gosh, that's a, that's a good, a good question. So encroachment in terms of development. Yes, a business, a business on the cemetery and um, we've been kind of into a bit of a legal. Back and forth with lawyers and town council. I mean, yeah, so I, that's, I guess that's a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty sticky kind of question, but yeah. So yeah. <laughs> um, I would say. Say I'm gonna I'm gonna do the total bureaucrat thing and say <laughs> talk to Andrea O'Brien in our office. <laughs> so um, Andrea O'Brien works with me at Heritage NL, Andrea at HeritageNL.ca, and she is the person that has been dealing a lot with municipalities, um, and she has a much better understanding of the Municipalities Act than than I would and what towns can legally do in terms of protection. Um, mm -hmm. The Provincial Archaeology Office can put a stop work order uh, on on work that's happening if it's if it's disturbing a historic site. Um, and they have done that in the past. Uh, in, this but if case, it's, in this case, the work is already done. Like right. it's uh, you ask for forgiveness, not for permission. <laughs> right. Uh, I, yeah, without knowing the specifics of it, I, I don't know what to say, but yeah, give it, give Andre in our office a shout and, and, uh, and she might have some ideas and, you know, navigating town councils is always, um, a challenge. Um, I, I just broadly in terms of heritage protection, I think, I think generally people think government has a lot more power than they actually do. So for Heritage NL, for example, we don't really have any protective authority. And sometimes that comes as a real surprise to people because they would assume that the provincial agency that deals with heritage is able to protect things. Uh -huh. um, and we really can't. Um, in Newfoundland and Labrador, that power really rests with the municipalities and the Municipalities Act. Um, uh, and that, that means that our municipal bylaws are as strong and are as enforced as council wishes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it gets very political very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I will certainly contact. Uh, you said it was Andre? Andrea. Yeah. Andrea. Okay. Andrea. Great. Yeah. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Okay, so one of our people in the queue has disappeared, so we're down to just Pat Angel. Okay. After Pat's after you've asked after you've answered Pat's question, what I'll do is I'll then call on Fred Smith, president of the society, to give some closing remarks. So, Pat, your microphone should now be active. Pat, are you there? We cannot hear you. Pat, are you there? We'll give him three more seconds, shall we? Yeah. And Pat, if you have a if you can hear and can't speak, send me an email, Dale at heritagenl.ca and I'll and I'll give you an answer if I can. Going once, going twice. Okay, Pat, I'm going to turn off your microphone. And now Fred Smith, can you uh, join us again? And uh of your closing remarks. And I'm going to un unmute you now, Fred. That works a lot better. Uh, okay, just a couple of uh, follow ups. Um, I enjoyed the, the question of how do you get the information off the headstone? I've seen people go in the graveyards with really super fancy photography equipment and ultraviolet lights, infrared wide variety of wavelengths 
and they do fantastic stuff sometimes. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of other ways to get information. Back to another question. Uh, the Family History Society a couple of years ago started a, a program it was falling apart during the pandemic times, but of, uh, we call it genealogical tourism. And someone is coming, going to visit Newfoundland and they want to find out where, what street their ancestors grew up on and what house they lived in or where their grave is. And we'd match them up with somebody who would take them. And the first one was the next speaker, Chad Angel, and uh, take them to an interesting site. And uh, it worked quite nicely, but we only have a limited, limited capacity. So uh, thank you, Dale, for a very interesting, informative, and enjoyable talk. And thank you, David, for keeping all this running. Uh, you must be getting tired of doing this so often. And thank you, audience, for showing, turning in, you know, tuning in. Um, hopefully, we should have some, another speaker for you in the near future. And uh, uh, good night, everyone.